All right. So I guess there's a trade-off already. The trade-off is you're going to have to listen to one more talk. But the, you know, that's the negative. But the positive is it's the last one. We're almost, we're almost there. There's a coffee break, and I guess a discussion lies on the other side. So that shouldn't be too bad. Um, so I'm going to try to leave off, thankfully, a lot of topics that uh, I uh, that are kind of in this part have been hit either by um, some of the other kind of primary lecturers with some of the research talks we've seen, some of the stuff that I've already talked about. So hopefully, a few of the different threads get looped together if my uh, brain can still function sufficiently to make that happen. So I want to talk about um, ecological specialization, trade-offs, what it takes to be able to coexist with each other, cooperation, et cetera. A lot of it on kind of relatively general scale and then point out some examples. Um, so ecological specialization would be decreasing performance in alternative environments while you're adapting to the current one, right? And so what makes this and a lot of the stuff that uh, Vaishali was talking about a bit different is she was looking at fitness falling apart in the very same environment that they were being you know, grown in, right? And so that's a different sort of scenario. Here we're talking about if you evolve, you know, whatever population size you are in some given environment, what happens now if you were to be tested in, in other different situations? So quiz question to start off. What evolutionary forces are capable of driving evolutionary specialization? Selection. Or is that the only evolutionary force? Yes, yeah, yeah. So and basically, like drift, right? If, like if it rises to frequency, yeah, uh, right. And so it's it's basically the same, like the same forces that will cause adaptation can certainly cause this too. Uh, and the question is, you know, uh, which of these might be happening under what sorts of scenarios? So do we even see trade, uh, ecological specialization evidence for it? Here's an example that I like um, from the lab of Francois today. Um, and is looking at life history trade-offs and natural phage. And so this also is nice. I haven't mentioned virus very much so far. Sorry, viruses. But we just heard a lot of great stuff from Lindy. And so this is talking about that sort of thing. And so they looked at two particular traits in phage and looked to see it, it, are would there be evidence from natural isolates that are already out there, have been experiencing uh, selection in the past, suggest that there might be some degree of ecological specialization? And in this case, they were looking at a survival versus replication trade-off. Are the viruses that can make themselves really fast, have burst sizes of you know, thousands or 10,000s, et cetera, perhaps make kind of not so nice viruses, whereas those that are really careful and special and make only 10 or 20 viruses have viruses that are more robust. And so they did two different things. They looked at tracking viability. Um, and this is looking at, you know, it's hard to think of something that's dead as being viable, right? Like it's just a hunk of proteins with some nucleic acid in it. But the question is, can it still function to do what it needs to do? And so you can take you know, a tube. You could do it in you know, all sorts of different scenarios. You can see the timeline here is days. And you can let it sit for various periods of time. And then you, you check the titer, how many particles are in there that can still make Plaques. And plaques are kind of the opposite of a colony. You spread out a lawn and you look to see you know, how many empty spots you see. So what do you guys, as have, you've often been declared physicists, think of those lines? Log scale versus you know, linear, what kind of a process is this? It's an exponential decay, right? I mean, those could be different rate, you know, radionuclides and just seeing you know, at different rates of decay. So if it is an exponential decay, what does that say about the process? Kind of said two things, I would say. When C14 offs itself and becomes a C12, how many steps were involved? What's inferred, at least, that it effectively behaves as a, there's how many steps? Like it's just kind of like a one step, one process. Also, <laughs> what about the, um, that process as a function of time? Did these guys show aging? where they lose viability quicker with time, or the opposite? Right, neither of those, right? It seems to actually be constant with time. It's actually kind of cool that something you know, as complex as a phage, and I think they're, they're reasonably complex, behaves as if they're just you know, C14 molecules. And so you know, I think that those are kind of the, the two neat aspects here. There, there was a quite also a wide range. 
of rates. You have this exponential decay. So it seems to be constant with time. And you know, behaves as if it was a single step. All right. So they got that data. Then they wanted to look at you know, replication rates. And so did kind of, sort of some of the stuff that was talked about before, where you can infect and then over um, you know, kind of a shorter time scale, look at kind of how fast you see increase in um, phage numbers. And so they gather some various data there. Um, and th they've already plotted it one way, though I think it's a little bit uh, challenging to see that way. Again, there was a wide range. I think it would have been easier. So unfortunately, if we're talking about a trade-off, we don't generally want to look at a positive correlation because that seems like it's the opposite. But they plotted mortality, a bad thing, against multiplication rate, which is a good thing, right? So I'm going to put it as survival versus growth, right? So just flip this whole thing around. Then you know, what do the data look like? You know, the data themselves seem to be along some lens of possibilities. OK. Why? Fine. There's a correlation. What might you, what might you think that, there, this, this, that there's a challenge for these viruses? Where, you know, what data are missing, so as to say, from the natural strains? Where else in this plot might you see data, hypothetically? Right? We can see it here. We can see it up there. Why didn't they see those, right? They could have had stuff down here or stuff up there. Why do you think they didn't? What, what about that top corner? So pink and red do not show up very differently, unfortunately. They do on my screen. But um, these guys versus those. Why do you think they didn't see these? Would, would this be a fit virus? If you had really high survival and really high growth rate? Like, so why did not? Huh? That, that, that it's constrained, that it's not possible, yeah. Do you know what it's called? There's a word for like something that's like best in, in all or many possible traits. It's got a kind of fun little, both starting with the D, two words, Darwinian demon. <laughs> like this idea that you could break the trade-offs and just be the best in the entire Tangled Bank, which means you wouldn't have a Tangled Bank, it'd be you because you're best at absolutely everything. You just knock all the rest off. Um, and so the, the, you know, these up here, the implication is it's just not possible. And because if they were, they'd have very high fitness beyond anything that's seen. All right. The rather simpler one. What about these? Why don't we see viruses down here? Low survival, low growth rate. When, well, these have low survival. Like just, huh? Yeah, so like essentially from a fitness perspective, they just kind of suck. Like they don't do anything well. So are these, the implication is like, are these possible? Yeah, and in fact, they might be highly likely. You know, in terms of like what Lindy was just talking about, it sounds like the vast majority of mutations that occur may, you know, pull, uh, you know, viruses down into this sort of range, and they, you know, be either you know totally lethal or, um, you know, or effectively so. So these would just be selected against. It's not to say that they're not possible. They just will tend to get outcompeted by something else. So possible. Low fitness. All right. And so what's the implication? Is that there might be some sort of a, these data suggest maybe there's, I mean, I mean, these are actually very, very different phages. If you care about phages, and some people do, you know, more than others in this room, like these are not even closely related to each other at all. So it's not like you're taking close relatives. This is like wildly different things. There seems to be, to some extent, 
something that seems to be kind of holding back this, this uh, concept of Darwinian demons. There's another word that's sometimes given to this sort of idea that there may be kind of a, a leading edge of a compromise between a couple traits. Two words, first one with a P, second one with an O. Pareto optimality, is that a phrase that has come up? So certainly that's, that's something that, that you'll hear uh, bantered about for this sort of a thing. So that you may not be the best at any single trait, but you might be the best possible compromise. You're the you know, pentathlete or whatever, decathlete, you know, uh, that you're really good at a lot of things, even if you'll lose the marathon to the best and you'd lose whatever, the long jump to the best. But the best kind of best possible compromise. So what causes ecological specialization? As we just talked about, there are kind of two possibilities. Antagonistic pleiotropy, which I'll get into here in a second, and this is um, when it's driven by selection, and mutation accumulation when driven by drift, right? And so pleiotropy, I'm assuming this is a word that probably came up somewhere along the context of thing. I don't remember if I've heard it exactly stated, but it's a very common evolutionary biologist sort of term. That basically the idea that a mutation could affect more than one trait. And so probably it's, it's popped up at some point. And of course, if it's antagonistic pleiotropy, it means you got better at something, got worse at something else. Um, and so, uh, you know, caused by mutations. And so that's kind of, I think, the suggestion from the sort of data that we saw before, perhaps. But there's another way that you could lose traits and be good at something and be bad at something else. Cave fish are really good at living in caves. They happen to be pretty bad at something else. Eyesight, right? And it's not clear, like in some of these cases, you know, either one of these actually could have been a player, but it's possible that it falls only into the second one. So mutation accumulation as a force, not as a style of experiment, is the neutral loss of of alternative traits due to a lack of selection. So the first one's driven by positive selection for one trait and an inherent kind of linkage, at least from that mutation, causing the other one to go down. Mutation accumulation is just, you're not selecting for something for a period of time, and it's possible to accumulate mutations in it. And this can act at any population size, right? So for unused traits. right? So you know, while Vaishali was doing her experiments with the um, you know, the C. elegans eating E. coli, they may very well have gotten worse at eating yeast or at living at a different temperature or something else. Even at the end of 100 or even if she did, you know, end of a billion, you can still get worse at other things because there's nothing, you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, because of a lack of selection, it can happen at any size. It requires very small in, as we saw, to, to you know, potentially to get into this meltdown where even in your own world, you can't keep up because of drift. Sound good? So, like that all seems fairly straightforward. What kind of expectations do you have? Which of these two, in general, will tend to act faster, will have more parallelism? And be higher in a mutator strain? I want you to take you know, a second to think about why, you know, what, what, would your, you know, what would your expectations be you know, if you've got these two different processes? We're, we're going to be looking at this across a, a, well, actually the same experiment analyzed in a couple ways. So, I don't know, we could have AP is leaning you know, over this direction towards DEPA, you know, and, and mutation accumulation is leaning away because she's clearly selectively advantageous. So, who do you think would be faster? Antagonistic pleiotropy or mutation accumulation? I see, you know, a lot of people sitting straight up, but I see, you know, a, a little bit of a preponderance leaning towards uh, antagonistic pleiotropy. The concept, at least, would be if you're, if you're driven by selection, you can rise based upon the selective coefficient, not by drift, with especially in large populations, is going to be pretty slow. So that would be the, the idea there. What about parallelism? And this one's a little bit subtle, perhaps. Um, I 
People are still tending to lean towards DEPA. All right, everyone loves you. Um, why, would, why would it be more parallel? It's not, it, it's not exactly obvious. Because you're not in the environment that we're testing you. Like you're, you're being selected environment A, and we're asking, and we're saying you're gonna have more parallel traits, trait loss in environment B. Why? Like, I agree with you, but why? Like it's, I think it's a little bit more subtle. You guys lean that way. Okay, so that's that's a good that, that's a, an excellent test taking strategy. Eliminate the one that you think is unlikely. But why should why do we expect it to be parallel? Like, why wouldn't they just be equal then? Like where where where, where are we actually expecting the parallelism? It, it, like at the phenotypic or maybe genotypic like targets or whatever for the adaptation that due to selection, if the same genes or functions or whatever are being selected upon, whatever trade-offs those genes or functions might have trade-offs with may lead then to parallel trade-offs, even though the trade-offs weren't going on during the time that they were evolving. Does that make sense? So, you know, like I said, it's just, it's a little bit more subtle. I think it's, it's thrown out there very um, quickly often, but I think, this one is, it's the, the hypothesis that, that the adaptation is in parallel traits. I did on this. And this causes the parallel trade offs. That's the thought. All right, now, which of these should be higher in a mutator strain? If, if so if you were gonna evolve, you know, they could either be in the same population together at the same time, but let's imagine the simpler thing, you know, one flask, normal mutation rate, another flask, 100-fold higher mutation rate. For now, let's ignore whether or not that speeds their adaptation, because it actually doesn't matter. That's probably gonna be too subtle to matter. But uh, even if we were to normalize for that, which of those two forces that got slightly cut off would be higher in a mutation, uh, in, in a mutator? Sorry, Deepa, Lindy doesn't like you anymore. <laughs> mutation accumulation, right? These are, this is the accumulation of things that you just can't purify away, and if you're, you've got just a ton of mutations coming in per unit time, Chances are there's going to be more such things accumulating, even if you don't adapt, you know, particularly different in terms of rate. And so that should be leaning towards the mutate, uh, mutation accumulation. All right, so these are kind of three characteristics that one could expect. Now, frankly, the best way to test it, like how would you want to know this given trade-off, this given thing was caused by one or the other? Actually, I realize I don't have this on the slide. What would we just be the, the straight up test? And then you don't have to make any statistical arguments. So you evolve on one substrate. Let's say they get worse at another substrate. And I want to know which one of these was involved. Improve it so there's you know there's no statistical test or anything needed like it's just it like we know now for sure that it was this way versus that way. It involves measuring fitness exactly, but fitness of what? Because this already is the fitness of like the overall genomes, etc. But the genomes might have many mutations by then. So if they've already got like ten mutations and they've gotten you know like, we're evolving in glucose, we test them now in maltose and they're worse. Was that driven by selection or not? Yeah, so you'd have to find like which one, or potentially more, but like which one of those mutations, to put it most simply, caused the maltose loss. And then ask, on, this is, gets a little tricky, on the background it occurred in, not even necessarily on the ancestor, on the background it occurred in, was it neutral or was it selectively advantageous? 
I mean, it may be deleterious, but like I said, in, in most adaptation experiments, it wouldn't necessarily be. Does that make sense? But you can actually just test and know for sure. This gets hard if you've got like, you know, 50 or 100 mutations. Do you want to test all of those and figure it out? And then you have to know the order, the whole adaptive trajectory, and go back to the 37th step when this mutation occurred, put it on the 36th step, and ask, you know, like, so it's, it's a lot of work. But in principle, that's, that would be the, you know, the, the ideal test. Mutation um, causing uh, fitness in environment B to go down was causing fitness in A to go up, or fitness in A to be let's say equal, right? Like, like was it neutral or was it beneficial in the environment that it actually occurred in? And there are a few examples of this. We've had uh, a case where we looked at this. It can get tricky, as it turns out, because they can stack on top of each other, so epistasis can rear its head. But anyways, it, in principle, that's how you would want to directly test this. All right, so if we want to look at evolution, where often do people turn? You know, have people turned and been kind of at the front edge of looking at a lot of these things has been in the Linsky lines, right? And as you've heard many times now, they evolved on glucose. And so it was just glucose as a food source for them to eat. Now there's a little bit of a star there because it turns out there is a chelator a thing that helps make metals be bioavailable that's also added to the media, citrate, which a lot of bugs can eat, which E. coli itself can actually eat if it's anaerobic. So it is a novel trait in an aerobic world. It's not actually novel to E. coli. Um, but, so, but we'll say that they basically just evolved on a one resource glucose environment. And so there was a classic paper by Von Cooper and Rich Lenski um, back in 2000. And they uh, took these strains and they analyze them in what are called biolog plates. And as we'll see, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it maybe brings up a little bit of a similar theme to some of the things Vaishali was saying about sequencing techniques being differently. Like different approaches can sometimes lead to some different things. So biolog plates, it's a proprietary, you can spend a lot of money per 96 well plate. I think they're like 25 bucks or something per 96 well plate. Because they've nicely arrayed for you 95 different substrates already, so it's basically just you don't have to buy the bottles of each of the 95 substrates and have someone sit there and array it all out. And so if you're not doing a large number, fine, you just buy them and, and you, you put up with the price. Um, and the key thing that is actually really cool is they increase the sensitivity of whether your strain grows in it or not, especially for kind of not, not such great substrates. They put a dye in there that while the cells are respiring, the dye will turn blue. It will go from clear to blue. And so when they grow up, it doesn't just go from clear to a little bit cloudy. It gets nice and blue often. Uh, so that's great. Um, and then the, the typical metric that they use is actually area under the curve. Because, all right, you've got this amount of blueness. How, how do I know like, how good you are based upon that? And so the, the way that this is done, you have all these different strains. And so imagine these are two different strains, um, or it could be two substrates by the same strain, whatever. And you measured hour 4, 12, 24, 48. You've got your measurements. And as the assay says, they're taking the trapezoidal area under the curve. And so you would say for the blue guy, right, we'd add up that area. And that's how fit they are. And for the purple guy, be like that, right, that these area under the curve would be, end up representing kind of the fitness for each, all right? And they wanted to ask the same questions we were just asking. Were, were, the, were the losses in uh, alternative environments fastest while adaptation was fastest? So the two processes seem to be linked. So that's question number one. Do you see parallelism in terms of what traits are lost, or does it look relatively random? Because again, if, it's, if the adaptation was driven by selection, the selection was causing the trade-offs, then the trade-offs might look parallel. And then third, they wanted to ask if this, there was faster loss in the mutators. So, 
Did the Linsky lines start with any mutators? They didn't. They actually used like, essentially the exact same strain for all 12. There were actually six of one type and six of another um, for reasons of competition and detecting contamination. But um, they all started with typical mutation rates along the numbers that Vaishali was talking about. So then why, why would I be asking for those faster mutators? I can't remember if this came up. I haven't brought, it did come up, great. So some of the lines became mutators, right? Where a mutator arose and before it got lost by drift, generates a beneficial mutation in which it could then draft its way up to fixation. Are those, did the word, oh dear. <laughs> Need my little eraser. Um, Right, so that's the idea, which it sounds like it came up, in terms of why a mutator could be beneficial. So of these um, four lines, at least by this time, uh, increased rate about 100-fold, and a few more by later on. Okay, so those were kind of their, their questions we want to look at. And this is what the data looked like. I need to write this again. So it's going to be a little bit big. Haha, <laughs> I can do this. Slick, huh? All right. So you saw this already adaptation. This is only through 20,000 generations. Um, this is kind of an overall metric of total catabolic loss, kind of like a Shannon's information indexy sort of a formulae, or you can just look at what went on. So, what do you think? Was, was there at least a parallel shape to the, the trade-offs and the adaptation? Were they both fast at the same time and slow at the same time? I'd say you know, within reason, yeah. Things, you know, things fell off relatively faster here than they fell off there. So we can give that a check mark. Yeah. Yes, parallelism in losses. Don't worry, I will not make you pronounce any of these. Um, but these are different things that uh, were informative. Green is a gain, red is a loss. Not surprising given what you just saw that things went down other than up. Um, and then it's showing how many of the 12 uh, had a significant difference. So what do you think? Parallelism? If this was a Poisson process, would, would the data look like this? Well, probably not. Like, there are many, many, many cases where you know, like all 12 lines went down in a given substrate, quite a few, right? And so there, there's a, an abundance of parallelism, so that seems to be resounding a yes. And then these guys are normal and mutator. Did the mutators lose traits faster? I mean, the magnitude is lower, but it is certainly, it's not statistically significant. And remember by how much they were mutated. They're mutated by like a hundred fold. And that's, it's a pretty small difference. So largely a, a no, I would say, for that. All right, so given those, Findings, what do you think? Trade-offs in the Linsky lines. Does it seem to be driven by selection and we would call it antagonistic pleiotropy? Or does it seem to be better fit with a neutral model of just if you don't use it, you lose it? I haven't said which direction, but just like leaning towards Cavita, I think, yeah. So I think the second one, that you don't, uh, or sorry, that was it? The antagonistic pleiotropy? You, you actually remember the direction. Wow, impressive on day five. Final hour, yes. So this looks like antagonistic pleiotropy. It looks like lots of um, catabolic, you know, metabolic decay, and thus driven by selection. All right. So, so I've described a few things about 
the way they did their experiment. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> that is a wonderful question. Yes. Is the dye used really relevant for fitness? Right? It is, it's, you know, and there are numbers of ways that this could be potentially a bit of an issue. Um, one is it wasn't the same environment. The assay that they were testing was 96 wells and the other one's a flask. So yes, it's different in population size, but I'm not worried about the demographic properties. The big thing that, that time after time has been an issue is this could have led to low aeration, which would lead to more fermentation and things like that. It's, it's a classic thing that unless people do something exceptionally well, growth in multi-well, especially 96 well plates, at high concentrations of food, which are supplied to the biolog, can lead to, so it would be a bit of a different environment than they were ever in, which is fine. Like, it's still an environment, but it certainly could be different than the one that they kind of grew up in. So that's already one interesting one. But this one, I think, is a really critical one. Are you, by following the dye rather than the amount of cells, like, you know, is this really growth? But the other one that I think is surprisingly important would be this one, the assay, their, their, their metric. So based upon, you know, to rough approximation, are those areas, you know, is blue bigger, purple bigger, are they equal? They look about equal, right, within reason, if I drew them, you know, properly. If the blue and the purple actually represented growth, which one's going to win? Hmm? Possibly. Why do they stop, generally speaking? Like, why does it stop and then kind of stay flat? Hmm? So, yeah, so this is different than building apartments in Bangalore or something like that. That space does not typically be the thing that, that limits them. Otherwise, that would be a very reasonable scenario, right? You know, well, it was a Gauss with a little, um, uh, you know, uh, looking at the seashore. And, you know, space, I think it could be a very reasonable way of thinking of these things. And I think this the whole carrying capacity, you know, all these sorts of words, if that's what's holding you back, perfectly reasonable. Um, why did they stop growing? Why do people leave a party? You ran out of food or drinks or whatever. Like they, they ran out of resources. But, so the purple one's slow. It would run out of resources here. But if they were to compete together, when would resources run out? Like here. And then things are going to stop. Who won? The blue, right? And so in a batch culture environment where there's a purely public substrate, guess how much impact yield, like the amount of cells you could make, on that food matters for selection. Zero. It's absolutely, completely zero. You make some equations and run, like you can see it has absolutely no effect, which is kind of weird at first. It is all about exponential growth rate. Private resources, which we'll actually talk a little bit about later, it can matter. Yield doesn't matter, and yet, given how long they ran these things in the trapezoidal area, if it went up to a higher number, that's going to really strongly tilt things, and really it's only the, the rates that matter, right? So it's not clear that this even represents fitness, even if all the other concerns were not there. I cannot tell you the number of papers I've seen who have used that as a fitness measure. Is it a phenotype? Sure, it is absolutely a phenotype, but if, you know, and in, in the natural world, who knows, right? Who knows how much private resources matter? But if you evolved it in a flask and you show me, like, I, like, I will just hit reject instantaneously on a paper because, like, like <laughs> at least that part of it, because it, is, it just does not actually matter. Um, so you know, this is not growth rate. Wow. Or competition, et cetera. And so, it does turn into one of these stories. I had a new graduate student in the lab, Nick Leiby, and he was doing a rotation. I'm like, 
this could be a fun little rotation project. I've always been curious about this you know, kind of aspect of the Linsky Alliance. I wonder, I wonder if it's worth taking a second look at this. It ended up being kind of like the, the major paper from his thesis work. Um, took much longer than a rotation, but that's a very common thing. Um, so we did a few things a bit differently. We used 48 well plates that were very well shaken, and we had, were able to demonstrate that their growth rates there were very comparable to what you get in a flask. And so we feel good that like, the environment's at least reasonable. We did look at actual you know, cell densities, not no blue dye. And most importantly, we assayed growth rate, which, and we tested, you know, is very nicely correlated with fitness. Does it matter? Given that I'm bringing it up, I'm sure you already know the answer to that, but how did it matter? So, let me show you this. I don't want you to see that one yet. So, look at this. Let's see, how can I maximally obscure everything else that's going on? All right. So this is how good the strains are on glucose which is what they evolved in. The ancestor, after 20,000, after 50,000 lines. Lindy looks very perplexed. You should. The thing you evolved in, you damn well better have also improved. Even if there's some like, conversion factor between the two, but this is going in the opposite direction. Whoa, like that's, that's worrisome, um, quite worrisome. I would say, another interesting aspect. I mentioned that one, that like one of the lines actually evolved to eat the, the, um, the chelator, which is pretty cool. Awesome evolution of novelty and things like that. When you measure it on Biolog, that citrate utilizer, it looks the same as the other lines that don't eat citrate at all. I mean, it's kind of painful, actually, how Poorly, you know, like those kind of qualitative things look. All right, let's, let's give it a statistical shot. What does this look like? And so there's the, the biolog AUC measurements versus growth rate. I mean, there is a correlation, but you know, it explains 18% of the variance. But it should look pretty problematic uh, in, in, in a few kind of very particular ways. Like, what does that whole lineup of things mean? If you're on that line, like up there, what does that mean? Did you, did you turn, did, based on biolog, could you use that substrate? Yeah, can you grow on it? No, right, this would be like the chewing tobacco of food sources, like you can chew it, you can do something to it, but you can't actually like subsist on it. Um, like they don't grow on it at all. And it represents a very large portion of the data. They do something, it's a phenotype. It's absolutely a phenotype, but it's not fitness. And the problem is this is being uh, considered from the perspective of fitness in alternative environments. So it is absolutely a phenotype, but also consider this glucose phenotype, that, which itself went down. So one of the primary things that happened is basically all of the strains fairly quickly become less able to turn over the dye. So they're less biologable, that's a trait, and there's a trade off there, but it has nothing to speak of, like, how well could they actually use those other substrates? Does that make sense? And so, unfortunately, does, from the perspective of metabolic, like, so it is a trade-off, but it's a trade-off between growth on glucose and biolog color on a biolog plate. That is certainly true, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with that. We've repeated their biolog data, like there's nothing wrong with the data. It's just interpreting that as fitness suddenly. It's not at all reasonable. Many false positives. But they basically just got worse at the assay. All right. As you can guess, I have no financial interest in the Biolog Corporation. Um, so, what if we look at growth rate? Um, you haven't seen it yet. What, what's your intuition say that it like, should look at, should look like? Um, you know, it, are, are, um, all right, here, first question. Are we going to see substrates they haven't seen for 20,000 generations? 
will they tend to do better on them, same or worse on them, just, just overall? Better towards Deepa, because she's awesome, same or worse? Seems very reasonable to be worse. Parallelism? Doesn't seem unreasonable. I, I mean, I would, if I had to guess first, I also would probably go, whatever, par parallelism, I guess I'll also go that way. Um, faster early on, I mean, those things all seem very reasonable. So these are the data at 20,000 generations. And bright, re dark, like dark red is your awesome compared to the ancestor, dark blue means you're worse. Very patriotically colored. Um, but so, do we see a preponderance of, of ecological specialization that in the process of evolving to glucose, they've gotten in general worse on other things? What would that look like? What color would that mainly be? That would mainly be blue. Mm. Like, there's blue in there, right? There's no single answer. There are some things, like ribose at the very top. We actually know the answer there. It's antagonistic pleiotropy. It's one of the very first mutations. It's very low selective coefficient. It happens at exorbitantly high rates because it's driven by IS-mediated gene loss, like what we just heard about uh, before. So we know that's antagonistic pleiotropy every damn line very quickly. So it's not to say that there's only one trend, but surprisingly, on the whole, there's actually more correlated gains than losses. So not only do we need to rethink what might be causing trade-offs, we have to ask, well, wait, were there any? Right, there were actually more gains than losses. And all the little stars represent uh, statistical significance. So, at least at this point, we would need to call it, on the whole, synergistic pleiotropy. It's not antagonistic. They tend to be correlated, you know, positively correlated gains. Um, and parallelism? Like, do you, parallelism would be like stripes of relatively similar color, right? Nice bright reds, bright blues, you know, something like that. There are a few examples of that. Like, I pointed out the ribose acetate everybody's better at uridine for whatever reason. On the whole, it's, it's actually, you can do some different metrics on it. It's, it's modest at best. It's better than random, but not very strong. Yeah. Correct. I think in terms of like an overall, so those are the ones that are individually statistically meaningful, right? If you were to ask, what's the chance of having a massive patch that they're all light, slightly red, right, then yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we didn't, this is not the kind of paper where we went in and got into every damn detail and try to make big stories out of each one that was not statistically significant. That would not be a good idea to do. Then, then tuck in, do the assay more, like get it, get it that more carefully and see yay or nay. But writ large, I think it's fine. These are just the things that were, you know, on the, somewhat weaker ends. Because the assay, the growth rate assay at this scale probably is accurate to maybe 2%, 5%, you know, in that kind of range. It's, it's actually harder to do it with E. coli than methylobacterium because they grow so damn fast. So you have a, a fewer time points to be able to get a good curve compared to something that grows a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, oh, we haven't gotten to this part. So these guys, are the mutators. Probably, you might not have noticed them as being different. What about the mutators? Are they like, are they different? A lot different? Other than like that plus six guy, which has already got actually a fair amount of blues going on, as a block? No, they don't really fall out at all as being different at this point in time. So that part actually is the same as, as the earlier finding. Yeah. Okay. So that's 20K. The other advantage we had is another like, uh, 15 years had clicked by, and so we could ask about the 50K lines. So what do you think this is going to look like going forward? More of the same? That's not a bad starting point. Um, 
know, it's, it's hard to know, you know what, what kind of expectation you would have. Certainly, I mean, 20,000 is not a short experiment, that's for sure. 50,000. Looks like this. So I think perhaps I heard at least one wow, which makes, oops, what the heck? That's always what you're hoping for in a talk, right? I can get a wow from the audience. But these are the mutators. As a block, do they look different? Yeah, I think they look different now. They, there's definitely a much stronger tendency towards blue. I will point, so one of the reasons why they're not all blue to the same extent is some of them became mutators earlier than others. So like the error minus one is a late mutator. It was somewhere in the 30,000th? I can't remember. Um, uh, but yeah, so, so it's not been in that state for as long. But by 50K, those are the ones that were. So now you can see a big difference mutator versus not. Parallelism, I mean, some actually, if anything, parallel gains. Like there's some nice little stripes of bright red in the non-mutators and things like that. But, but it's certainly not very, I mean, like I said, more than random, but you know, I would still say it's on the somewhat modest amount. There are plenty of stripes that are mixtures of reds and blues and things like that. So is it more parallel, parallel than randomly throwing down colors? Absolutely. But it's not like really strongly so. Um, <laughs> so how fast was adaptation from 20K to 50K compared to zero to 20? It was slower, but the rate of loss is faster, right? So again, that goes kind of against the tied to adaptation kind of concept. Um, let me point out, let's see, other little cool things. That right there sets the whole world on fire because that is citrate. That is some people's like favorite experiment in the history of the planet. I think it might be a little bit much, but <laughs> I think that is a fair depiction of things. Right? That's the evolution of a novel trait. Is it the only novel one? <laughs> There's actually a few, quite a few more. All of this, all these organic acids, these are all novel substrate use. To date, not, not explored, other than in the citrate line. Um, so, what were the losses, you know, like we basically found, yeah, no, not much, you know, kind of medium uh, and definitely a yes in terms of faster loss in the mutators. So if you had to make like kind of one sweeping statement um, that, you know, overall, mutation accumulation seems more dominant. than antagonistic pleiotropy even though the losses themselves, I mean, there's still a whole bunch of red on that screen, even though it's been 50,000 generations where that hasn't been added to the media, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so be careful assuming things will be traded off if you don't use them, right? It, it, I think we, you know, our, our knowledge is not so strong um, about that. But what could we do, right? How might we want to predict which substrates are most likely to experience increases or decreases. So imagine you actually came in here as you know, metabolic biochemists. Said, mm, I'll tell you which ones they are. What might you, like what, what would be a reasonable hypothesis? You're evolving on glucose, and I give you a list of substrates. What would you look for to imagine these might be the most likely to be positively correlated and also increase, and those, no, that, if I had to pick that somebody lost, like that would be the loss. What would be the kinds of things? So what about the function? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And how would the structure, you're absolutely on the right track, the structure of the substrate, but what would that mean biologically? What biological parts would depend upon that? What enzymes, right? Are you using the same damn enzymes as glucose or fairly different? I mean, some things are gonna have to be the same. The way you're making histidine is gonna be the same whether you're eating glucose or eating proline. It doesn't really matter. But a lot of the other enzymes, they're different. So, you know, it, it all comes around to perhaps, you know, like, are you using the same enzymes? And there's a couple interesting reasons here. Um, so, let's imagine you were using different enzymes. Uh, and, and thinking about what we heard from some of the mutation accumulation. Imagine you use an alternative pathway that uses only one gene, that's a KB long, or you have an alternative pathway that requires 50 genes to make some specialized cofactors and takes up 50 KB of the genome. So it's the same amount of like metabolism going on. Which do you think is more likely to be lost? Why? But the one, the other, the one gene's not useful either. Well, I guess I'm trying to get at like, why? You know, why might like I agree with you? The 50 KB would be more likely to experience a loss, but why? So that's interesting. So that more genes, correct. So, so that's actually a very good point. Um, uh, if there's more genes that are different, I didn't have that even on my list. So I think it was in our paper, I just forgot. Uh, bigger cost, if there's a little bit of background expression, bigger cost and so then better to lose. It, so that would be by selection. Okay, so that's for one of our evolutionary forces. Tying into the drift as a force, why might a 50 KB requirement for a pathway versus a 1 KB for a pathway matter? It's gonna have a higher mutation rate to that pathway, right? And so you just have more chance of something having gone wrong. IS insertions, jumping into it, all sorts of things. So it's also, um, Bigger target for mutation. And also, if, if you have a similar flux pattern, and even like the magnitude of shared fluxes, pathways that get used in both cases might be relatively more similar. Okay, so how might we predict like which pathways are being used or not, and what what kind of flux patterns? We don't have data for this. Like what might what kind of flux patterns would be used to grow on this and this and this and this and this? Does there exist some sort of metabolic framework to imagine how a, a cell might be growing in a given way? Boy, if there only was. Not you or not you. What could you do if you wanted to guess how a cell grows on maltose or proline or something? The two answers are either MCA or FBA. Remember, this was the flux balance analysis, the second one, the FBA. And this is because that gives you a best guess. Like, what would be the optimal set of pathways you could be using? And let's, you know. So at least it gives us a way to try to ask this in, in some sort of framework. So we looked at, so this is the mutational target size. How many, what's the total amount of DNA encoding enzymes in pathways that are uh, not needed while you grow on glucose, but you will need to grow on that substrate? Make sense? That's, this is what you should be able to, just get rid of. So there's a lot of things that you don't need if, on ribose you know, compared to acetate. So what's the prediction? Right, the prediction would be if it's a small target, less, and then the, the top is how, how good you're doing. If you're highly fit at the top and if you're dead at the bottom. So we'd, you know, we'd predict something that direction, right? Some sort of negative correlation. Big targets will tend to get lost more than small targets. 
And then the data, the two colors, yellow are the non-mutator and purple are the mutator. But you can see in either case, no, like it really does not help at all. Um, no, no correlation there whatsoever. Okay. Target size doesn't seem to show much. What about similarity in carbon use to that of glucose? And so, same thing, non-mutator versus mutator. And there are several different metrics one could use. You guys are probably familiar with a fair number of these. So if you like list out all the enzymes that you need and you compare those two lists, you can take the Hamming distance between them, the number of unique enzymes for glucose versus X, as well as X versus glucose, kind of all the things that don't match. That's what's shown. You take the Euclidean distance between the actual quantitative flux vectors. We did that. You take one minus the Pearson correlation. You could take the count of the reactions, just like the second half of this, the count of the reactions that are unique to that thing versus glucose. This one was the only one that was significant. It has an R squared of 0.02. Whoop de doo Like, it's not, like, yeah. So basically, it doesn't, to our great, like, and, and Nick was kind of disappointed by this. I'm like, no, this should go in the paper. This was a hypothesis. It's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. I'd have thrown down a few dollars or, you know, a fair number of hundred rupees on that. And it's just, it's wrong. But that's okay. Like, I think in science, we don't get to see the wrong hypotheses enough. But I'm not embarrassed. Like, I think it was a fine hypothesis. It was wrong. Um, but I think it was actually pretty surprising. So again, this would have been the hypothesis. And nope. So surprisingly, the one thing that correlates really well is, is it a sugar or a non-sugar? All right, that makes sense. Glucose is a sugar. Maltose, dextrose, sucrose, all these things, they're also sugars. It correlates. If you're a sugar, you do worse. And if you're not a sugar, you do better. It correlates in the wrong direction. <laughs> the very kind of thing. Like, it's, it's amazing, right? Like, this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only thing that shows a clear signal the wrong way from what you might think. And so or not, we know a little bit about this because um, there was some needled work by Mike Travisano, some of the early days of the Linsky lines, that we know that there's actually um, trade-offs in sugar transport. That occurred very early, PTS system for those who care. I'm probably only talking to Supreet. Um, but like, like there were some interesting trade-offs that went on there. So ironically, things that were most similar to each other and how they might get into the cell, there were some really clear, strong trade-offs and things that, that are much different would have used a different transport system anyways were sheltered by it. But like, that's certainly not a hypothesis we would have thought of initially. So, all right, so we're done with this. We're writing up the paper. Um, and Nick had actually done twice as much work. Everything I've shown you was done at 37 degrees because well, they evolved at 37 degrees. But since my lab normally studies methylobacterium, he had done all of this work also at 30 first. We show that there's something interesting, and then crap. All right, we're going to have to do this. <laughs> like, sorry, Nick. I think it's interesting enough to be worthwhile. And given that we're not just going to aim for some lowly journal and, and aim, this was plus biology, like, I think we got to do it at 37. And then we asked, like, what do we do with the old data? Um, he did not even really ask me, like me asking the question, because <laughs> he didn't want to think about it. But I was like, well, what could you do with this data? Why might data like this matter? And I think this actually is very similar to things that, that you heard from Vaishali um, in terms of kind of, you know, thinking about uh, how might mutations damage uh, traits uh, in, in kind of a relatively generic way. So I think it's important to realize that these mutators, which is where we see the strong trade-offs, their mutation rate's about 100-fold higher. By 50K, the non-mutator lines have on the order of like 80 to 100 mutations, of which the vast majority that have been tested have come up as being beneficial. There are obviously some not. The mutators have like 1,000 to five or 6,000 mutations in a genome of 5,000 genes. So like almost every gene, you know, on average, has a mutation somewhere. 
if you, this actually goes back to some of the things I was saying before with, um, with epistasis. What's the, what's the most common way that you're going to end up hurting a protein due to a mutation? At least the hypothesis for kind of the typical way. Like an, if it's an enzyme, there's going to be some specific pocket, and you might hit one of those few residues that damage its activity. But what's, what would be a really generic way that you could mess up proteins? This is thought to be the main kind of deleterious mutation. Proteins need to be active, and they also need to, they need to go from here to, right? They need to fold, right? They need to be fold and be stable, yeah. And so the thought is the majority of deleterious mutations impact stability. But where does that relate to the 30 versus 37? 30 degrees, right? A marginally stable protein, maybe now it'll be okay. And so I said, all right, here's, take a look at the data, and only if I'm right do you need to do this, otherwise we'll, we'll ignore it, that's fine, Nick. Like, look, like, the mutators. My, my prediction would be that the mutators will be specifically, have a tendency towards being rescued at 30 degrees compared to the non-mutators, because they have this abundance of trade-offs caused by a huge number of mutations that have just kind of peppered their genome with possibly destabilizing mutations. That was, you know, like the, the kind of rationale. So you're only going to see that really after the, um, the large amount of trade-offs had, had taken uh, place. So at 20K, same colors I didn't uh, re relabel. Non-mutators in yellow, purple in pink. And this is, so this is how well, like the, here's relative fitness of one and relative fitness of one, how well they grow at 30 degrees versus how well they grow at 37. If they had very strongly had a like, temperature adaptation and it got like, specifically good at 37, these would all be above that x equals y line because they'd have like, better fitness at 37 than 30. So you can see like, there's actually a little bit of a tendency that way. Um, not too much difference between mutators and non-mutators, but again, there weren't that many trade-offs. Let's look at the other side. You can already see the corner of it. There was a pretty strong difference. You do see the non-mutators are also, see some cases where they do proportionally better at 30 than 37. It's not to say they don't have mutations that have something to do with temperature, but the idea is that the mutators have really taken a burden. And you can see that there's a very strong tendency, including a ton of things that everything down here is dead on that substrate at 37, not in glucose, right? They can go on glucose just fine, but that substrate, they're dead. But they can grow at 30 on that substrate. Yeah. And you can see this you know, that kind of thing is what's shown over here, kind of how many, how many rescues occur in the mutators versus the non-mutators. So what does all this kind of then suggest? That part, this, that, uh, maybe not most, but it might be a little bit strong. How about just lots of the decline in mutators due to destabilization of proteins. Of what were unused proteins in glucose. All right? So I think one, you know, one of the things that was really fun from this is it really, like, it, it was pretty surprising. It took you know, a long time before you saw these uh, trade-offs show up. Et cetera. You know, I think you know, this, was, this ended up being a fun story. Something that I think was really nice and classy about this. So I certainly um, like had talked to Rich during this and said, you know, really interestingly, we're seeing this, and he was very open to it. And at first he was a little skeptical, but then once he saw the data, like I heard him give talks and he would, would you know, mention this, et cetera. And when we um, submitted this, uh, the person who wrote our um, the, the commentary piece in POS Biology was Von Cooper, whose paper you know, we were comparing to. So I think it, you know, like it was, you know, thankfully, you know, sometimes you can change your mind. You know, think, 
things, a new way of looking at things can change a story, and, and thankfully the, you know, the participants can be you know, pretty hunky-dory. Unfortunately, it's also not always the case. But this was really, you know, I thought they you know, were very classy about the whole thing. So are these, these trade-offs going to be permanent or not? And it's been interesting. Through a large number of experiments, I'm just going to mention this relatively quickly, where you take strains that have had different levels of trade-offs uh, on the x-axis and now evolve them in that new substrate. And very quickly, they pop back up relatively easily. This is also similar almost to what we heard about from some of the MA lines, what we heard. Um, Krishna talking about in terms of the, you know, the hybrids, et cetera, low fitness. It's amazing. <laughs> Selection is, is, is pretty impressive. And, and a lot of these have, have been able to be you know, kind of pulled out uh, fairly quickly. And so you know, whether the top is data, an old data of Michael Travisanos and E. coli, there's some Michael Desai data, and uh, Sergei Krasimsky and yeast, there's, there's been a lot of data of uh, rapid amelioration. I mean, it won't always be the case, right? Sometimes you will have just lost a gene, you can't get it back, and there isn't another good way around it, fine. But there's been plenty of cases where these can actually be reversed pretty quickly. I'm gonna skip that one, though it's cool, and it has one of those nice diagrams, sorry, Lucy. Um, I'm waiting minutes, let's see, the one thing. So let's end with um, talking about when, when, so this is neat, when does it matter, right? Like when would, Evolving to substrate A and becoming worse on you know, B and C, maybe better also on D, but worse on E and F, et cetera. When is that gonna actually lead to perhaps being able to coexist where you could have two types? Sympatric speciation, another term that you've heard coming up, things like that. And so you know, what do you need for this to actually permit coexistence? And I think the tricky thing here is to think about what, what do we actually mean by coexistence, right? We mean this, I think what's typically meant is a relatively more um, in, imbued statement that this is stable maintenance of you know, more than one genotype or species or whatever. And what I mean by that is not just co-present. And so we can see more than one genotype even if they're deleterious mutations, mutation selection balance. Even if they're neutral mutations, just accumulation of cryptic variation. Clonal interference, even multiple beneficial lineages can all be there at the same time. Or of course migration in the natural world. Natural world you could have all sorts of things be there just because they're coming in. It doesn't mean they can actually kind of coexist and be stably maintained, right? Why did I leave so much space right there? I was gonna ask you. I'm just gonna go ahead and keep moving for time. So what does it take? The key thing for it to interact, did people hit frequency dependent fitness in a strong way besides mentioning it a lot? I've heard a couple minutes, okay. So the key thing is what uh, kind of fitness interaction you have between two strains. So if we have, if we start at different frequencies of X versus Y, you know, it's dominant, it's at the middle, it's down low. We can imagine different sorts of outcomes are possible. If they, Within reason, at large populations, so let's imagine this is you know, 10 to the seventh or eighth or something, and we start at you know, 10%, 50%, 90%. Within reason, what are those lines gonna look like if they're neutral? They're just gonna be flat, right? Nothing's gonna happen. What if I take one of those lines and I shift it, right? So these will just go straight. But what if I take one of them and bump it down to here? Now what's gonna happen? If I took that, you know, could just like add in more of the other uh, strain or whatever, is it gonna bounce back up, fall down? It's just gonna stay there, right? Like it will not, you know, like, all right, now that's the new normal, flat it goes. What if there's just an absolute fitness difference between the two? Like we mainly talk about, you know, a, a W of 1.1, an S of 0.1, that kind of thing and we start at these different frequencies, and it's independent, X is better than Y. What's that gonna look like? We saw Lindy draw some of these, right? This is just gonna move up. Sorry, the curvature there is probably not exactly right, but you know, it's gonna do this kind of thing. If I take one of these, and I move it to some new spot, 
It's just going to do like what it would have done from that spot. It, and you, you just you know, have one strain win. But what if, oh, I didn't write them. Oops. Negative. So you can have two types of frequency dependence. Well, you could have all sorts of complicated things. Negative frequency dependence, we've heard this a little bit, this idea of fitter when rare. Oh, no, that's not me. You may wish it was me, but it's not. All right, so if you're fitter than rare, what are these negative frequency dependent fitness? Lots of words, what's that gonna look like? If you're fitter when rare, so what's that gonna happen to the purple line? Yeah. It'll do something, right? What about the red line? It's gonna do some sort of this, right? You're gonna have this sort of scenario around some equilibrium. Okay, and what happens now if I take one of these, you know, I've got it at the equilibrium and I bounce it away from there? It's gonna head back to kind of where it was before, right? So this is, this is what we're gonna end up needing for coexistence. What about positive frequency dependence? And then I'm gonna quiz you after this one to think of a trait that would fit each one of these. This is fit or win common. All right. What does that look like? Yeah. What about the red? And then, what about the orange? Oh, that's fun. Um, yeah, exactly. I haven't told you enough information, right? Where's the equilibrium? Is it below or above it, right? If it's here, then you're gonna get that kind of thing. But you know, if I had started here, it would go up that way, right? And so, what kind of biology might? Oh, and you know, and if I take one of these, I mean, I think the fun thought experiment is like take this experiment and bump it to right there. It was crashing, and now you've crossed the threshold the other way, and it'll, it'll cross over to the other scenario, right? So what's, what's a type of biology that an E. coli could have, for example, that would show frequency-independent effects? It, you, it's also generally transitive. If I compare A to B and B to C, I know A to C. The thing that is the dominant part of fitness in a batch culture scenario, probably mentioned 50 times. Measured on a semi-log scale? Don't make me cry at this time. Like growth rate, for example, would be a nice, like that kind of a trait. You will just, like you're either faster or you're slower. Like th there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Like it's just true uh, under any, you know, you know, under these sort of circumstances. And so a growth rate would be a good example. What about negative frequency dependence? Where I, I'm gonna do well, rare, and I'm gonna do poorly from common. Mm So limiting resources can sometimes lead to these sorts of things, but you, it gets complicated. You need some other scenarios involved. Um, it, it, is, it is actually technically possible. Um, there are some somewhat simpler. What if instead of one resource, there were two, something like that, right? If you have two different things to eat, you could perhaps one be better at one, one be better at the other. So that's certainly one easy way, multi-resource. 
I mean, there's, there's many, of course, that fit any of these sorts of things. So that, they, they interact because they, don't inter they potentially don't interact, and they can each just kind of subdivide the world. They could actually interact in a way that would lead to this too. What if there's one resource, but kind of a dominant, perhaps, genotype spat out a different resource that the other genotype, the other lineage is good at? So you can get like cross-feeding. That would be something else that would fit this bill. What about positive frequency independence? Mm. Where as long as there's enough of me, I can take you down, but otherwise I won't be able to, and I'm gonna lose. It's tricky, huh? So one of the classic examples, uh, microbial at least, is production of toxins. So if I'm a genotype that can make toxins, all right, that makes sense, I can hurt you. Why would it be positive frequency dependent? Exactly. The more of me there are around, the toxin concentration's higher, you do even worse, right? But why would I ever lose? Per cell, I'm imagining producing the same amount of toxin. But if it couldn't build up enough to make up for the cost of making it, right, there's often a cost to making something like a toxin. And so toxin production is the kind of thing that can exhibit this sort of fun dynamic. Mm. So how test for coexistence? The key thing is we can take every, all of our thought that we just had there in terms of like dynamics through time, I wanna plot it differently, right? Instead of looking at proportion versus time, let's put fitness versus proportion. What kind of line should I draw for this situation? Is the proportion of x, as it's close to zero, is it above or below one? When x is low, Above, yeah. If x is near 100%, would fitness, so fitness, because we're talking about like we're normalizing around one, would it be above or below one? Be below one, because you're now less fit than the other type. And so we just said that that was negative frequency dependence, and now I'm showing you fitness against you know, frequency portion. You would do something like that, where now what was a through time, a plateau, it's gonna show up this way, right? And this is very much like, but fitness, remember, is like one plus selective advantage. Selective advantage is like essentially like D, you know, uh, you know, genotype DT against genotype frequencies. So basically this is, you can just look at this from the point of view of if your, you know, DX DT is uh, um, positive, you'll increase. And if your dx dt, you know, is negative, you know, compared to x, you're gonna decrease, right? Here's, you know, stable equilibrium point, right? But, but I've, I've plotted it as fitness. So that's why I'm doing this around one and not around zero, right? Because the one just kind of comes for free with fitness. It makes sense? So, whoa, you could have like all sorts of stuff going on and I'm not gonna go through each and every single one of these. But the fitness could be, of course, always above, always below, you could have negative frequency dependence, you could have positive frequency dependence, all sorts of things are possible. Which of these are actually gonna be kind of interesting, right? Often they're gonna be boring, where if, like line number one, who's gonna win, X or Y? Let's see if we can do this fast. I'm not gonna award points though, but who's gonna win, pattern one? X, line two. Okay, somebody else. Line three, we have negative frequency dependence. Who's gonna win? One, the other, or will they both coexist? We have negative frequency dependence. The red line, number three. I think I heard it, maybe. It's still above one. So yes, you, you are less fit when you're common, but you're still better. And so then it doesn't matter, it will, nope, X. X will still win by extension number five, negative frequency dependence and you just are always below. 
Same thing with positive frequency dependence. If you're always above or always below, it doesn't matter. You just, <laughs> fine, there's a frequency dependence to how fast you're gonna lose or win. The interesting ones are the other two cases, right? And we talked about uh, four. Four is negative frequency dependence crossing a fitness of one. So then you're gonna get x and y, right? No matter what, you'll always get coexistence. What happens with number seven? This is what Lindy you know, was kind of asking me about when I threw out the question. It depends, right? You're gonna get either x or y, you know, depending upon uh, x naught. Yeah, okay? So it, it's, really, you know, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. Good, how do you know what's going on? So imagine, you know, you saw this. We've seen this kind of a thing. There's a lot of stuff going on. Is there anything there that screens out for frequency dependence? Possibly, but if you just imagine each color arising on what's behind it, is just pick some value that's higher than what was there before, you could explain, you could probably throw down some numbers that would approximate this kind of dynamic. And you don't, you know, it looks awfully complex, but there's nothing that screams negative frequency dependence. Compare that to this. Right? And we heard a little bit about this um, from Paishali when she was talking about like the 96% and rising up to, et cetera. Um, what here makes you think there might be negative frequency dependence? Yeah, like, this, I mean, this is kind of a relatively strict case where like the equilibrium didn't even change. The equilibrium itself could modulate and, and shift through time. But it looks like you've got selective events occurring in the red population and in the you know, bluish population that are relatively separate from each other. So this would be like from genome sequence data, the kind of thing to look for is, you know, but it's, it's tough. Like you have to actually have enough resolution and you know, et cetera to, to get some feeling that really they, they seem to be behaving kind of in their own separate ways. So, what did the data actually look like? So turning back to the Linsky lines, <laughs> um, and this is definitely one of those things you could just sit back and I, I could just stare at this for a long time. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, these are allele frequencies. These are not genotypes, so it's not quite a molar plot. These are allele frequencies. Era plus two at the top. Any sign of frequency dependence? You know, there's interesting things, I'm not sure if they came up before about like mutational clusters that often, there'll be multiple alleles that seem to all be rising up together as a background, they're finally stacked on top of each other to beat off whatever, beat down the other um, lineages that were there. Look at like era minus six. What's this large numbers of mutations and the, and you see some their total always sums to one, but their exact frequency, you know, it's like a P and a one minus P sort of a thing. That's what it's gonna look like, right? When you look at data, whether it's, you know, a patient or a flask or something, this is what negative frequency dependence is gonna look like. We've got <laughs> a lot of stuff happening, no doubt. Um, what do you think this is? Holy moly, like that's just crazy. That's not crazy, that's crazy. I've actually already told you the answer. What do you think might have happened around here somewhere? This is the mutator, a late mutator. Things are just fine up to here. Well, I don't know about fine. It's still pretty much a mess. But they were okay before then. And then, holy hell, like it just gets really, really amazingly diverse in terms of allele frequencies. Yeah. So yeah, that's the mutator. No evidence. Frequency dependence. And here there seem to be slightly different. Two distinct. Some people call these ecotypes. Certainly that you've got, um, we would call this sort of thing adaptive diversification. Be one word. And I certainly wouldn't go the strong capital S version, diversification. 
Speciation. But you would also call that like sympatric speciation. It's at least speciation, even if they haven't made species. But at least in the process of, in the same world, they seem to have separated out into two things, at least from the point of view of selective events. Here it's purely asexual, so it's harder to know from other perspectives. Um, I'm going to say that we call it there. Uh, yeah, it's going to. Um, I'll go ahead and leave the slides on there. I was going to talk about how, how you could actually try to make some predictions of coexistence if you could know how different things could grow. And for this perspective, actually using flux balance analysis to try to predict m multiple genotypes within one species cooperating with another species, it was bidirectional costly cooperation, and trying to predict like, what frequency that it should be 30, 70. And how would that change if you add in another? How would it affect the selective coefficients on like, being a hyper-cooperator and not? But thankfully, you know, one fun thing about evolution is there are so many fun topics that you know, two weeks is not enough. So I think all of us would probably say this has been enough. But I think it's been a lot of fun. Um, I think we should get caffeine. Since I'm about to leave the stage, I just want to say thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Kavita, other instructors, and everybody else. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I do not want to do this next week. But, uh, but this has been great and exhausting and really cool. So, thanks.